It is a scam when you don't allow everyone to operate on fair terms. We are the Robin Hoods of sports betting. We take something back from the rich bookies and enable our customers to beat them instead. G'day everyone, welcome to episode three of our new How to Make Money Online series where we chat to experts outside of the sports betting arena who specialize in other forms of investment and ways to make money online, similar to what we do at TradeMate Sports with sports betting. Marius and I have explored both cryptocurrency and options trading during our series so far, but today, as you can see, we're moving over to the stock market as we welcome on Paul Briscoe from the YouTube channel Paul Paul oh, screw that up from the YouTube <laughs> channel Paul Briscoe welcome Paul ah thank you very much for having me I guess um just don't call me an expert because <laughs> I really I I have a bit of bit of knowledge and I've been learning a lot myself and applying that but there are so many people out there that are much much smarter than me within the uh, the investing community. I just um, pick up on what they say and try to apply it myself. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's I think that's the great part of getting you on today <laughs> is that is that we can uh, share in your experiences of what you've done so far with your channel and I mean your own investing and um, I mean I read a little bit about you and yeah, it, it seems like you've almost made the made the mistakes in front of everyone. So I think that's a really interesting <laughs> aspect that you can that you can come from today and share everyone your experiences so far, mate. So maybe you just want to start things off and uh, give us a bit of background on yourself and yeah, and how you got started with it all. Yeah, I guess my name's Paul. Um, and with investing it's been it's been a weird journey for me because I started kind of life uh I don't have any form of financial training or even my I always talk about my parents who didn't have a clue they don't have a clue about money and I think a lot of people are in this particularly in the UK don't have any form of understanding of what's going on and how people can possibly make money from their from using their own money and um I've got to a certain point in my life now where I've just I've lived my life on pretty rec pretty recklessly to be honest with you and now I've tried to turn it around and I'm realizing that it, the education and the knowledge of wealth building particularly wealth building building slowly online and all that it, it just wasn't available to me and uh, part of me wants to discover why that's not available to me and also try and change my life for the better and save for retirement, try myself, try and make myself a little bit more wealthy. And I apply all of the different tools that uh, different money managers have expressed in the past and also saving and building base uh, along the way. All right. I think that's an interesting perspective because a lot of people <laughs> who are watching will probably also you know, just be getting started with stock market investing. And it's it's about like, how do you figure it all out? Um, yeah, I recently started actually investing in the stock market myself, like within the last couple of years, and basically just starting out with, uh, with index funds, keeping it simple. Um, but it is like a, a big world out there. So uh, it's important to, uh, to figure out like, what what you do listen to what you do find out what's important and what's not yeah and did your did your parents have any involvement in in investing other than sort of outside their own retirement funds which they probably would have got through work no not at all and they don't really know too much about it either so everything yeah. for me like everything i need to uh, to figure out for myself yeah and, uh, yeah it's yeah, because that's... it's because um I'm guessing you're around late twenties, early thirties, something like that. Sorry, I don't want to age you there, but you're probably in a similar boat <laughs> to me. And um, our, our, the generation before us, our parents, came from a totally different perspective. And there's an excellent book out there called Morgan Howe by Morgan Housel called "The Psychology of Money," 
And he explains very, very early in that book uh, that people aren't crazy. You go through, you can look at YouTube now and people say, look, 10x this or uh, grow well, slow like that. And everyone thinks you're crazy or you're crazy because we're in these, we're in this world where uh, there's two camps to invest, investing. You either make money, 10x your wealth quickly, or you get rich slowly and try and build it. I'm very much more in that camp than the other camp, but I'm still open to all different things. However, when we say those people are crazy for thinking that they can get rich quick or they can get rich slow, or like our own parents that never got involved investing at all, that we think they're crazy now. They came from a totally different ex perspective to us. They came from an era in the 80s where interest rates were like 14% at times. So they could just bong their money in their bank account and they make 14% on their money. No problem whatsoever. It's completely, this is called the risk equity premium. This is those people didn't need to think about investing because they could just make money without even think about it. Totally risk three. Now we've had years and years of low, low interest rates and we now need to take a bit more risk. We now need to consider uh, getting into investing in different ways because we don't have any other options we don't have any risk free options to make our money and that's where that's where our generation has kind of fell on the idea of wealth building because our parents didn't need to do it so they didn't pass that information down to us and now we have to scramble to relearn it all again and i think that's what we're seeing in the stock market all the movement and why stock market investing is so popular at the moment not to mention we've just been on a 10 year bull run as well that helps For sure. Uh, I think I once um, I once read that, you know, the in order to become like wealthy, at least like above sort of uh, the definition, it was kind of you need to be able to have additional money after you pay your bills every month that you are able to put off and save or invest for the future. And then it's a matter of how to do that. And the larger you're able to increase that gap, the more you can make your money work for you and make money from the money yeah. um, but if, if if you if the majority of your money is also just going out every month then it is difficult but um, it's quite incredible how much things can grow if you just give it time I don't know if you played around with some compound interest calculators <laughs> but it, it gets absolutely crazy after like 30 years uh, of saving so yeah it's getting hard as a youtuber to find different ways of explaining the benefits of compound interest and explaining the benefits of uh, just long-term building your wealth slowly because it's boring. It's really, really boring. Uh, <laughs> but that's the name of the game. That's how you should do it. With, I mean, with you guys, um, with you, Alex, doing your trading and your gambling on the sports, oh, sorry, gambling. I, I wanted to ask you about that, actually. But um, uh, <laughs> with the, I don't know what you call it, your sports betting. Are sports you are, applying, yeah, are you applying some sort of compounding effect to that as well, do you think? I mean, yeah, so, yeah. you go, Morris. I'll, I'll just take that one. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of the, the beautiful, beautiful part about what we do, because um normally a bookmaker has an edge on you now the bets that we are finding are able to both overcome the bookmaker's margin and give you an edge on top of that and a game of football only lasts for 90 minutes so after the 90 minutes you either win or you lose and on average our customers have had a return on investment of 2.5 percent per uh, pound that they wagered mm -hmm. and because there are a lot of bets a lot of games and they only last for 90 minutes you have very short investment cycles so you're able to get that compounding effect a lot faster you don't have to wait for like 10 and 20 years um, a season and you can have incredible like compounding effects already so that's kind yeah. of the the beautiful part about what we do at least yeah no, that's that's it's great it, it's good to see it see it come in because i like the I, I like the juxtaposition of sports betting and investing because I don't think they're that far off. A lot of people will tell you that they're far off, but I don't think they are that far off. Um, I think there's a lot more risk around sports betting because outcomes are a lot of the time 50-50, but you're talking about from your 
uh, playing uh, sort of playing the market and playing the valuers and playing the um the system more and in the same way we have trading options trading which is also very very aligned to the broker the the broker has a lot more advantage there so when you're trading you have to find those um advantage points against the broker as well but yeah with investing um it's a lot slower and the compounding effect that you're trying to feel is actually from the businesses that you're trying to own. So let's say you take a big company such as Visa. Visa is a very good compounder. Uh, these, Visa is a company that's going to reinvest all of its profits because that's where, that's where we're looking at in these businesses. We're looking at the cash generated from these businesses how good these businesses are they then reinvest that cr cash into its business into back into its business and therefore gain more profit from it which they give back to shareholders so that's where your compounding comes back from in specifically stock market investing and stock market trading obviously slightly different to your uh, your sports betting but yeah that's that's kind of where you're trying to look at the company from your personal investment point of view your investments are coming back from the cash flows in the business and you're essentially gaining those cash flows back to you which then you reinvest back into the stock market and you get that slow growth obviously it changes depending on how well your company's doing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Let's uh, jump on to some of the questions we have for you today after a good intro. Yes. Um, <laughs> how would you describe your uh, investment strategy? Uh, so my investment strategy specifically is this compounding of business cash flows. So we have a couple of ways to invest in uh, the investment world right now, you can go into very early startup companies. And essentially what you're doing at that point is you're trying to decide if this company, uh, I can't, uh, one, one of the biggest companies that I can think of right now in this sort of frame is a company called Nanox Imaging, which is an x-ray company. They've just built this new low cost, very small x-ray machine. And what, the, what you're trying to prove in the early stages of these investments is whether their concept their concept and their product actually works so we call it proof of concept and then we're trying to think we're trying to find out if it has an ability to scale so nanox now is building its own factory it it has a good production line with foxconn so it's proving that it's got this ability to scale and that company there is not going to give you back any cash flow in your investment. You're simply trying to sell that that company now in the future back for more than it's worth, back for more than someone is going to buy off you. So that's one way of investing. And the, the other way of investing that I do is based on company cash flows. So companies will have excess cash, exceptionally good companies, two companies that stand out as that right now is Google and Facebook who have exceptionally high cash flow. I think it's a 30% growth cash flow they have each year and year. And what they have to do with that money, uh, money, they have three different options. They can uh, give it back to shareholders in the forms of dividends and sh share buybacks, which is, a, which is an investment strategy that I go by. They can reinvest it back into the company or they can pay off the debt. And what I try and find is try and find companies which have a good balance of all three of these things. Uh, I like that these companies will pay back in the forms of dividends and share buybacks. And that gives the shareholder a lot more value for money for buying that company. Uh, it gets a bit more complicated on top of that when you bring in valuation of a company because historically these companies will sell for a bigger premium than they're actually worth. And that's where you have to start bringing in your PE ratios and your price to free cash flow, all the different ratios and metrics that everyone's using. So it's kind of complicated and I've gone, I've got, I've got quite a, built quite a big picture there, but essentially what we're trying to do in my investment strategy is get the cash flows from these companies back into my pocket and then reinvest them back into the market and let that grow over time. That's the beauty of that dividend compounder, that those compound interest calculators that you see everybody using online. 
Is that good enough? <laughs> yeah, all right. So, so to sum it up, um, you, you, you don't invest in the startups or you do invest in the startups? Uh, very so, few. So, so it would few. be right. very, very specific types of ones like Nanox and uh, I think yeah. Transmedics is another one. Very medical based I am in my startups as well. All right, so the the main focus of your portfolio is on these larger um, companies which have good cash flows and can give good compounding effects. That's like the main main thing with your portfolio. That is the, yeah, definitely. That is the goal. We call it sort of core satellite, which is a lot of what people try and base their uh, portfolios around so you have your core businesses which is your core cash flow generating businesses generally what we call blue chips which are uh, strong companies that have been around for a long time and they they've generally got this great cash flow building capability and then you have your satellite uh, companies which are your little startups which you know maybe in the future you can see but that's money that you are largely happy to risk in the market you're largely happy to to lose there. Okay, what what kind of just out of interest, like what kind of resources are you using to to figure out like cash flows and all this kind of stuff of of these companies? Is it like just simply trolling through financial reports, or is there easier ways to do things? There's a lot of mixes. There's a lot of mix to this, but and you always do need to see a company's 10Ks and 10Qs. You always need to revert back to them because any other resources out there are are really looking. They they're only looking at the 10Ks and 10Qs. So you need to very you need to find out if they're telling the truth. So I use some resources like there's a company called Seeking Alpha, which is very good. And they do a lot of really good opinion pieces on there. Uh, it's very 50-50 on whether those opinion pieces are actually well resourced or, you know, well educated opinions. So you need to kind of chuff through that. But the resources on there are very good. I also use one called Fast Graphs. So that's my main one at the moment uh, because that is a as a tool that you can use to really skew the numbers in whichever way you want you can look at you can look at different timelines of these companies um fast graphs it's it's just a very easy way of setting out a company's earnings and eps and cash flow and looking at that's the one i use mainly on my channel uh, just that uh, just for uh, clarity there it's not an advertisement or anything it's just i use it it's really good um but you can look at companies from really far away uh, from a long time ago that can uh where they where they were in their initial growth period and they could be growing two three hundred percent every single year but then once they get to uh what we call the mature growth stage they could be now you know growing at 30 percent regularly so you get to cut off a certain area of that of that timeline and only see what the business is doing now that's just one of the big resources that i've done uh that i use but you've got loads you've got absolutely loads out there why charts yahoo finance Seeking Alpha, all these are really good at showing you the historical capabilities of this company and the historical trends of these companies. And you've got to go in there. You've got to figure it out. You've got to know, you've got to start to understand, you've got to learn a lot about what the different terminology means. And that's been a big problem with me in the stock market is all this terminology that seems to have kept a lot of people out of the markets when actually it's really simple when you just sit down for five minutes and start to understand it. Yeah, okay. A couple of uh, couple of resources I've used is Atom Finance and Coifin, which are nice because they have apps. Um, so if when it's just sitting on the phone, it's it's pretty neat. And then yeah. I also tried uh, tried simply Wall Street, and what I liked about them was that they they kind of looked at they had an indicator for whether or not the the company was overvalued or not based on like the, the PE ratios and, and things like that. Um, and just just getting a big a, a bit of an indicator because sometimes it can be tricky with all of the numbers to kind of see mm -hmm. see what are they telling you. 
Um, and yeah, there's just so um, much data. So. Yeah, simply Wall Street, I think, is the undervalued as a resource, to be honest with you. A lot of people, particularly in my Discord, kind of turn their nose up at it because it's quite easy to use. They give you a calculation and they say things are under fair value or over fair value quite quickly. You can just look at it. It's nice, pretty good. But when, and I've looked at it, uh, Simply Wall Street's discounted cash flow valuation, and it's actually very robust. It's very, very, uh, the calculation that they use to make that, I know the chart you're talking about is where it says fair value and overvalued. Yeah. And it's got like red, green, and yellow. Yeah, I've looked into the calculation that's and it's a very robust calculator. It's much, much more robust than one I could do. So I do rate that that little chart as a really good um, uh, resource to just very quickly look at companies and determine if they are under or overvalued at this point. Hmm. Um, how many companies do you have in your portfolio in total? Oh, uh, I don't actually no right now it could be it'll be around 30 it'll be around 30 yeah. i am experimenting with bits of trading as well and some of the trades just become long-term holds because they've gone down so much recently but um yeah it's about 20 or 30 i am trying to cut that down though because i do think you can stretch yourself a little bit thin sometimes yeah how how much time would you say that you spend on like researching an individual company on average before making an investment? Because that's part of what I find tricky is like how much time should one really be putting into it in a, in a busy world with uh, everyday yeah. life and everything? And, and the other thing we the other question we get with that is when when do you know when do you know to press that buy button when you know what's what is it? And that's really really hard. We we are trying to develop some flow charts for this at the moment when to sell as well and it's uh, we're coming up with the same thing because valuation is very hard people use pe ratios and say oh if it's over 15 it's overvalued or if so it's overvalued and the truth is valuation is a simple metric of price to how much you value the company because there's a whole qualitative side of investing which it's the story i always say uh, you have your quantitative side and your qualitative side so your quantitative side is the numbers that's the bit that i look at quite a lot uh particularly on the channel because personally i think it's very easy it's very easy to look at the numbers and go okay this company could or might be close to being overvalued or might have a good discounted cash flow or it's well within my margin of safety. And at that point, I look at that and I go, okay, that's on the list now. So I look at, I put that on the list and I go, okay, now I need to learn about the business and how strong this is. I need to learn about the qualitative side of this business. And that's when you go in, you look at management. These are all what I call secondary fundamentals. You've got your fundamentals, which are your balanced cash flow, uh, cash burn, all that sort of thing. And then you have your secondary, which I consider secondary, but a lot of people will consider primary, uh, is like the management, um, how many, you know, market share, where they, where they sit in, uh, all their, all their different meetings, like where, where they are in the whole grand scheme of their entire sector. And if you can bring all both those together to, give yourself good conviction on a stock or on index or whatever you're buying if you can bring yourself to that point where you're very convinced it's going to be a very good investment for you and we'll go into a little bit more of that later i'm sure but <laughs> um get to that point that's when you need to that's when you can start to think about okay how much risk do i want to take with this business how much of my money do i want to take is it better than this business compared to this business i already own this business uh, do i want to give it more money than this and you can get very excited and um, this is where it comes to the of psychology in the markets as it's go up and down we have to consider that the markets are very volatile in general. We know that over history, it's gone up on a 
on a long trend line 100 years it's always gone up i hate saying it's always gone up because we we don't know that for sure um but stocks will go up in a zigzag pattern on the way and it's your uh, your ability to sit these stocks when they do drop 70 percent one year um so you need to have your psychology trained to know I'm not going to sell this stock if some of these fundamentals don't change and the price goes down. So, so I'm I'm not explaining this very well right now, but it all comes down to psychology and ability to not sell. So when you feel like you've got a stock, you've got a company, a business, and you want to buy it, you've got to go think to yourself, okay, will I sell this if the price goes down 100%? And if the answer is yes, and you've really got to do some deep soul search searching within yourself at this point, you've got when it goes down 100 percent. I'm a, if the answer is no, then you you I probably give myself the green light to go for it at that point. And um, but if the answer is yes, I do more and I keep going. I've got some stocks I've been sitting on now for about two years, and I still haven't been able to bring myself to go it. To do it and the price has just gone up and up and up and i'm still thinking oh as this goes up it makes it i may i become less convicted on it one of the recent stocks for this was broadcom and i wanted to buy broadcom probably march 2020 when everything else was super cheap and i think i only brought it about a month ago and that's because i wanted to understand the business i want to learn about it the semiconductor industry is very very volatile at the moment it's very very a very very strange place to be and it took me over a year and i think i missed out on about 70 percent of, of capital gains not including three percent dividends in that and oh yeah i it just took me ages to get to that one but i still bought it and i'm happy to hold even though right now i think it's pretty much flat yeah, I mean, if you believe that over the next 10, 20 years, the company is going to keep doing good, there's, uh, yeah, yeah, get in and, and this, just hold it. Yeah, it's, it's this belief, though, isn't it? Because we have these beliefs in the the word the term we the the term belief is getting very skewed at the moment, particularly here on YouTube. Uh, it's it, apparently it's just good enough to believe in, in it, that a stock's going to go up. And I think mm. that is getting a bit skewed here um, in comparison to what investing used to be, particularly in va value investing. So yeah, belief. I, I don't know. I don't know how to address that one. It's very, very hard uh, because a lot of people believe things. A lot of people believe in cryptocurrency. I'm a big believer in cryptocurrency as well. I'm, very happy to invest in ethereum a little bit of cardano a little bit of bitcoin as well but there isn't that there isn't a fundamental uh there's not a fundamental backing on any of the crypto currencies right simply because you can't tell which one's going to win no one knows and that's where that's where things are being that's, that's just my opinion though yeah, uh, I think uh, that's a good point. And also, yeah, doing a bit more research than just believing something is going to go up is always a, a good idea as well. <laughs> yeah, I guess not so. Just, uh, <laughs> not, not just thinking that Tesla cars are nice, so uh, I should buy the stock. <laughs> Tesla, Tesla's an odd one. Uh, I, and I don't want to get too too into tesla i do believe that tesla is over at this point but people confuse confuse valuation with their belief that it's going to go to four trillion or eight trillion or ten trillion uh it probably will but in that time but we don't know how long it's going to take to get to that point and it depends what your investment horizon is in my in my uh investment horizon right now is probably about 10 years and we don't know if it's going to make it to 10 to 10 trillion in the next 10 years it will be a very strong business but it's priced for that and that's what's very important to remember it's priced as one of the biggest businesses ever but it doesn't make a profit i know people will say it does make a profit that's why 
uh, it's in the S&P 500, but it doesn't make a tangible profit. It's based on Bitcoin and uh, green credits at the moment. So it will do very well. I understand that the business, and I'm not bearish on the business, I'm just worried about the stock price right now. That's all I can really say on that one. <laughs> I think one thing that can be good for people is to not just look at the price, but also look at the market cap and how that market cap ranks versus other companies. Uh, because, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, like the, the valuation is quite high and it's pretty crazy how large Tesla's market cap is already. If you compare yeah. it to some of the largest businesses in the world who are making huge amounts of cash flow, like Facebook, for example. Um, so uh, that's uh, always an important thing to uh, to check up on. Yeah, it's... Um... Um... Yeah, Tesla's Tesla's price, and and it does go to show when it did its stock split how much the price went up. Well, how much the market cap went up because the price came down. You know, it's a it's a it's an odd one to think that that people are just getting into it because of the price, and that's quite scary because that does set it up for Michael Burry's bubble. I'm not saying that's going to happen. All I'm saying is I'm just not willing to put my money into it right now because the stock price or the stock market cap like you say is a little too high for what the business is producing even though and I've, man you you wait for the tesla hate that comes after this uh, like even though the the business itself uh it's mega pack system is just doing so well in um los angeles and australia australia's got quite a few mega pack systems going out there uh, and the home energy business is just starting to really take off with Tesla right now. Um, but at the moment, you can only value it like a car company because that's all it's making money on right now. What type of investments are you into, Marius, just out of interest? What sort of stuff are you going for? Yeah, so I mainly bought index funds and putting yeah. like... Uh regular amount of money in each month into an index fund where my goal was just to minimize the cost because like half a percent of uh, additional cost per year, they need to um, increase the ROI with 2% to make up for that. Uh, so just keeping mm. it cheap, keeping it global and keeping it simple there. And then um, besides that, I also, it, it's, it's also a bit because I think it's fun trying to test yeah. myself against the market buying some yeah. individual stocks and there i go for tech stocks because that's what i find interesting and yeah. in general i believe that increased productivity and everything is growing a lot faster these days than what it used to be so when people are are looking at um are looking at uh, historical stock growth and everything and saying oh these rates are completely unsustainable totally viable that they are but mm. it is also it is also pretty clear that as technology develops uh, we are seeing like a, an almost an exponential yep. growth if you look at society yep. now versus 50 years ago the things that we have available and uh, the car today versus the car 50 years ago is just <laughs> night and day in terms of performance yeah yeah um so so i just in, in my view like tech stocks are what is going to Going to uh, be able to do those, yeah, and do those large yeah. gains. Um, Absolutely. But like majority, majority of my money definitely goes into index funds because mm. for like the the average person, beating the stock market is super difficult, or it's pretty much impossible. Like only a few people yeah. really are able to beat the stock market. So, yeah. uh, but the good thing, the good thing about the stock market is that it is. Um, it is, as you mentioned earlier, in general, it is growing because of increased productivity. So it's not a zero sum game. It's not one person loses money and another wins it. Everyone can win just with the growth in the market and yeah. um, c compounding and just not losing money and uh, and following the market over time is like the, the surefire strategy for, for winning in the long run. So that's, that's where I yeah. put the majority of my money. Yeah, and definitely we should talk about index funds because unfortunately we i haven't touched on that because that is the most important thing really index fund investing and passive investing for the average joe who wants to just get on with their life and not spend hours and hours and months and months researching stock 
for that is the best way to get into s p 500 all world anything like that or even just little sector etfs which uh little sector index uh tracking etfs are you know pretty pretty smart for what we call the average investor you'll earn your average return and you'll beat most people that are trying to beat the market it's so so important um because like you say it's not a zero sum game some game the world just gets bigger grows there's gonna be nine billion people on the planet by 2027 they're gonna need more they're gonna be spending more and if we keep printing money loads will loads will happen i do see downsides to index index fund investing um but i think they're quite far in the future the whole passive investing bubble as it were that michael burry shouts about i think that's quite quite far in the future good 10 20 years at least um where they're saying that so many people are passively investing into index funds that no one's really pricing these companies anymore and the companies that have just been at the top of that the top six percent the fangs as it were the top tech stocks they all will just grow because more people are putting money into the s p 500 and not really thinking about it it kind of skews the effectiveness of what we of the pricing of the market so eventually what what might happen is so many people have started to passively invest that it gets to a bubble point where it pops and people start drawing out their money those top six percent of the s p 500 absolutely collapse because of this but i do think that's a long time in the future i don't think it's for anyone to really worry about right now um but I just do put that out there as like the risk warning, as it were. Nice, mate. I'll just pop in here with with one question, and then I'll let you guys keep going again. Uh, <laughs> if I'm if I'm just starting up with my stock market investing today, or I'm very very new to the stock market, what would be, I guess, the most important thing that you would you would tell them about investing in the stock market? Like, what are the most important things to to know off the top yeah i do uh, this is so important because none of it is to do with getting a broker and none of it is to do with knowing about p ratios or stocks or even any companies in general it's very simple uh know your risk and build your base so building a base is so so important to investing particularly long long-term compounding investing but i think in any form in trading trading as well you, n there's no company that is going to turn 100 pound into a million pound uh, over any length of time i don't think tesla can do it and yeah, I suppose if you invested in Dogecoin, you might be able to get somewhere close to that right now. But if you manage to get that in 0 0.01, you might be able to get somewhere co close to that. Um, but there, there really isn't anything out there that can do it. So what you have to do in order to grow your wealth over the long term is you've got to save. You've got to increase your spend, um, increase your income and decrease your spending, live well with, within your means. And that is the most important thing to investing before anything, before PE ratios, before stocks, before index funds, all of that stuff. You've got to know, and you've got to sit down and go, okay, this month I've got, I'm getting paid X amount of money. I'm going to take 10, I'm going to take 20, I'm going to take 30% of it each month, and I'm going to forget about it. I'm just, it's like money doesn't exist. That money just doesn't exist to me. And that just goes straight into whatever fund or whatever broker you want to choose. It just goes straight into there and you never touch it. It doesn't matter how desperate your life gets or how desperate you think your life is getting. You never touch it. You never withdraw it. And you also, it doesn't matter how low the price gets on those stocks. You never touch it. You never withdraw it because the most important part of investing for anyone, and this is p very Peter Lynchian, it's the, uh, the, the stomach. You've got to have a strong stomach when you're getting into investing because prices go down, money looks like it goes down, and all that hard-earned time and effort that you've put in to save all of that money, uh, it's all going to go down. But eventually, historically, we know that the stock markets in general go up and the world grows. So more than anything, more than anything at all with investing is you've got to save and you've got to know your risks. So you've got to know how much money that you're willing to put into the market, 
how much you're willing to lose or how much you're willing to let's go down a little bit. And then uh, you've got to live within your means. It's so, so important. I suppose that's really similar for, for, I suppose that's really similar for sports betting and stuff as well, right? Because I know you're trying to grow very slowly and stuff, but yeah, it makes sense. I think think there's a lot of parallels. Yeah, because you don't, I mean, in sports betting, you don't want to go and if you've got a thousand dollars, you don't want to put a thousand dollars on your first bet. You want to put (laughs) ten dollars or maybe even less than that. Because yeah. there's so much randomness and, and variance that can happen. So, yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And I think um, it's probably something that people overlook when they first get started. And um, it's just one of those fundamental baseline things, like you said, that that people um, can use. What, what do you think overall about the, the stock market at the moment? Like, the do you think it's overvalued at the moment? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, even index funds, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, we take simple PE ratios like Schiller and and things like that. We we've never been at these valuations before. We've, or at least we've only ever been on a standard uh, Kate ratio like this, probably since the dot com bubble. That was the last time that it was like this, and before that was probably nineteen twenty nine. So we're at a very we're we're at a very strong point in the market that could just keep going up. You've got to remember this. So people were calling for an overvalued market in the, in the tech bubble five years before it actually popped. So five years is still a lot of time to make a lot of money, you know. But and you might lose a lot of it, you know. If you're invested in Cisco at the time, if you invested in Intel at the time, you still probably wouldn't have made your money back yet. All that money in 2000, and this is. This is so long ago <laughs> for us to think this is so long ago that none of us remember this happening. Unless you were a very astute, astute 10 year old at that time, you would not, you would not have known this was going on at the time. So I've tried to interview some people who were around at that time and who were investing at that time and get their opinions on what's going on. And they said exactly the same thing was happening. And this is, this is a scary bit, bit for me is I, I can sit there and say, oh, PE ratios are high, price to cash flows are high, earnings aren't going up as fast as, you know, employment. So why, but I don't have a feeling for it. I don't, I wasn't there when it has happened before. I've never seen it before. And this last COVID crash, that was nothing apparently, you know, that was just a little blip. We've, we've had three of them since 2010. So it's not like that was a really big crash or anything. People made a lot of money and it changed a lot of things, but it's, it's, I wasn't, I wasn't there for the big tech bubble crash and I wasn't there for the sixties crash and I wasn't there for the 29 crash. So I've been interviewing people to find out what they thought. And they said it was exactly the same same thing. People were saying it's a new paradigm. We're changing our we're changing our technology. Uh, um, there's this new wave of technology that's going to come, and it's going to uh, do all these amazing things. Uh, one of the old guys was saying um, they called me a dinosaur. <laughs> that's what they said. Like, and I'm thinking, wow, there's so many parallels with what these people are saying from 2000 and from the 1960s. And it all seems to be rehashing itself out. And that's not a reason to get out of the markets and not to invest. But it is a reason to be very cautious and expect that another crash will come at some point. You know, It's not just going to be this magical 800% every year that Tesla's going to get. Um, we, you need to be aware of how much people are actually willing to pay for these, for these stocks, these companies. And to be honest with you, even the index funds as well. So I found this part really tricky, um, just looking at my own investments and looking at, for example, the Buffett indicator, which shows the same thing that you mentioned. Maybe that was one of the things you looked at. Yeah. Um, so so what, what have you done with your own investments? Do you invest less now if you think it's overvalued or do you still keep going because time in the market beats time in the market? Or, yeah. uh, or do you, yeah, what have you done in, in the light of this? <laughs> Uh, nothing. 
Nothing is the answer. Um, other than psychology, and I keep meaning to come back to this with psychology because psychology is so, so important in the markets. It's the most important thing to keep yourself in it is understand what's coming or what could be coming and aim to stay with the worst case scenario. Be happy with the worst case scenario as it were. So if you have this dream that you're going to bet £10,000 on Dogecoin because it's going to become a million in three years because Elon Musk says so, that's probably not the greatest way to invest in an asset. If you go into Dogecoin and say, I'm going to invest this amount of money, but it could go to zero and I'm happy with that or I'm okay with that, then that is the way we should be placing ourselves psychologically in the market because psycho psychology is so, so important. There's a, f there's a famous graph that goes around every year, JP Morgan's Guide to the Markets, where you might have seen it. It has a little graph of all the best um, – the best performing assets over the past 20 years. And at the top, you've got REITs, and it goes to commodities, and 60-40, uh, 40-60, and it goes all the way down, and at the end is the average investor, 2.2%. So REITs make uh, 11%, S&P 500 makes 6.4% every year, and then the average investor makes 2.2%. And the reason for that, it, this is all based on data from a study, called, a study company called Dalbar, and they do a bit of qualitative data on top of that. They they put some reasoning for it. And they say the reasoning for that is because people keep selling. People look at it at the price and go, oh no, the price has gone down. We better, we better sell this. And that's not a reason to sell. You know, loads of people have made lost a lot of money on Netflix, believe it or not, because Netflix is a very choppy, very volatile stock. But it's it's gone up it's it's always gone up over the long term and that's what you need to that's what i'm doing essentially i'm not doing anything i'm just knowing my risk i'm just being willing to know that sometimes we can be wrong in our conviction and that's very so important and many youtube commenters probably need to learn that as well that we can we have to accept that we need to be wrong we we have to accept that we can be wrong sometimes and once you can do that and once you understand once you mitigate your margin for being wrong then that will make you a much better investor psychologically because when something bad happens to a company maybe you just do nothing and see what happens. And that's that's very, very important uh, going forward. So for me, I haven't changed anything. My aim is to invest in very strong businesses. And what makes a strong business is quite subjective. A lot of people see different positives in different businesses, in particular, like with tech stocks. I can totally uh, agree with you on, on many tech stocks. Google is probably my number one stock that I don't own right now and I should do. Um, and also uh, semiconductors is somewhere where I'm at as part of the tech game as well because it, as cars become more electrified and more technologically advanced, semiconductors are going to be so much more important. There's a shortage right now, should drive up prices. That's my aim with that one. But I'm willing to accept that I'm wrong. You know, that, and I think that's most important. So to date, what has been your best and worst investments? Ooh. Yeah, I, I, you sent me this one first and I was thinking, <laughs> what, what have I had that's really bad and what's I had that's really good? I rode the, uh, the energy, um, the, uh, the, I, uh, I rode the energy thing up from March 2020. So I did very, very well on that. I had different forms of hydrogen involved. And I also got out at the right time as well, which is is another thing that we need to really talk about with, with investing as well, is setting your goal and setting what valuation you would like to get out of a stock at as well. So Take, for example, Plug Power, which was extremely low at the start of March 2020. It was, it was, it was probably even slightly overvalued at that point. But we could see this change in energy appetite going on. 
And I think it just skyrocketed like 520% or something like that. And that was amazing. And also had lithium miners as well. Albemarle was a big one for me. Went up 150%, something like that, in the space of a couple of days. Made me uh, a reasonable amount of money for the amount of money that I have in investments anyway. I don't have a particularly large amount of money in investments um, in comparison to you know the people with millions and millions. But uh, yeah, they, they would be like sort of best trades, like picking up on the momentum stocks. It just doesn't happen very often. And we were in a very good environment last year for momentum trades. We're starting to find out now that investing is getting much, much harder. And you can see that with the big names, the big uh, Kathy Wood names, which are losing considerable amounts of money right now, losing a lot of flows. Uh, I think they're down probably 35, 40% right now. And some of their biggest holdings were, oh, they just got decimated, didn't they, uh, earlier in the year. So there's, there's, there's that. And then my worst investments, I'm trying to think. Um, uh, I haven't really <laughs> lost on anything yet. That's my problem. Um, it's just been <laughs> very, very easy. <laughs> it's last year was extremely easy. You could put your money into anything, and um, uh, it it was fine. Um, it's getting a bit tougher now. I, I suppose investment wise. My worst investments have been the ones which I haven't had enough conviction on, where I've kind of looked at it and gone, oh, McDonald's. McDonald's will always been ar be around. I better just invest in that. But then you realize when you don't, once you dig into McDonald's uh, business that they're actually losing money. Well, they're not losing money. They're losing revenue. And that might make it very, very interesting for McDonald's going forward, uh, especially with all the competition that's out there with chipotle and all the different big fast food restaurants which are now climbed on board just in just investing in something because it's always going to be there isn't necessarily a good thing and i've i've been uh, i've done that in the past and i understand what that's about and that doesn't drive good conviction it drives you to go oh should i keep it should i not and you know six months later you're sort of still only one percent up and you kind of go okay i'm out i don't i don't want to hold this because this has gone up a hundred percent and it all gets very confusing when you don't have your conviction so the worst they have are, are the ones which i could say don't help me sleep at night that's the thing if you're yeah. sitting there and you're getting up and you're looking at your computer in the morning and going oh should i really be holding on to that that's not good it's not good for your psyche investing is all about a life balance as well and if you're just constantly thinking whether dogecoin is going to drop tomorrow or if it's going to 10x tomorrow you're not doing your mental health any good there <laughs> and you you might as well you might as well just buy it in an index fund and forget about it for 20 years you'll be a millionaire at the end of it won't you that's the that's the aim <laughs> i'd no, say exactly. that's a, a pretty good sign that you have too much money invested in something as well <laughs> if you are yeah, maybe. On that sleepover. So, uh, yeah. But, uh, then, then you should uh, de-risk de there and uh, maybe maybe put it somewhere else. That's it. Knowing your risk. Knowing your risk. I've done it. I've been in stuff that people have uh, just recommended to me, and I've I've just lumped some money in. I've I've done it for fun as well. Shouldn't really say that, but yeah, I have done it for YouTube as well, just to see. I've I've had a thing recently where people will comment on my videos or something and i'll go okay i'll invest in it and so far all of them are 50 percent down I've, I've only invested like a couple of about 500 quid in each one but i'm i'm sitting there going this was a stupid idea because i'm now like 40 50 percent down on alpine four and uh oh god workhorse was one of them i didn't really put anything into walkers i stayed well away from it because i knew that one was gonna well i knew that i had my reasons to think that that was too risky and I thought something like Workhorse was going to go absolutely sour. Um, but yeah, it, it just goes to show that you can get your tips from people, but they'll do, they could do, just do terribly. And you're sitting on a 200 quid loss, 2,000 quid loss, 100,000 quid loss. And you're going, I've lost all my money. And I, it was because I didn't have my conviction in uh, what I was buying. Yeah. 
What? So you haven't made too many uh, bad investments, or you, you haven't made? I you know, can't really think of a, a worse investment. <laughs> How about you tell us some of your your biggest mistakes, mate, that you've made? Yeah, throughout your time of in, investing, and I guess how you've learned from them. Yeah, jumping in too early, jumping in to go going. It's very hard as well when you when you have a YouTube channel and people are shouting at you stocks every single day, and you you go, oh, actually that could be a good one, and you look at it and you go, oh, should I do it now because it's getting a lot of attention, it's getting a lot of hype. And the thing is, by the time that you hear about it, it's probably way past the time to have invested in it. Um, I keep, I can go back to Dogecoin again. It, again, it's the same, same thing. Possibly a little bit late by the time it started making the news. And Bitcoin was definitely, has, has missed a lot of its run since Elon Musk started going. I'm not saying that Bitcoin won't continue to go forward. It definitely could. Same with Dogecoin. There's barely any difference between the two in my opinion but uh there is there is something to what we call uh social media arbitrage where you can find a stock through social media and see how beneficial it is you can just go on google trends and you can search for the famous stocks that people are searching for right now mm. and you'll get a good idea of what uh, stocks everyone is buying you might be able to make a quick book and, and trading and things but generally it's 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 not a good idea when your mate goes oh have you seen this this stock will do really well and you go oh okay i'll i'll, I'll go for it generally you're buying at the top there uh, which is unfortunate and yeah i i could say that i've been guilty of that on a couple of couple of occasions as well and i think it's just a human nature thing again psychology it's just a human nature thing that it's very hard to avoid until you start to develop a biz, um a lot of discipline and I, again with your with the sports betting I, I imagine discipline is really really important there because you'll be you'll be finding your the right leverage that you want to go in at but you'll go oh actually chelsea's going to chelsea's going to easily win this weekend <laughs> in the champions in the champion uh, in the champions league and you'll go i better put a little bit more on that because i, I believe that and it could just go, it could have just easily gone the other way as much as as uh, as what it did so discipline's got to be really important with your thing as well right yeah, well, I, th I think most people that get into sports betting have a uh, have a gambler's mindset. Like all um, people that get into like, uh, I guess, value betting or you know, profitable betting strategies. Normally, they come from a a uh, a gambling, have fun, have a punt with your mates kind of background. So, uh, losing those tendencies to have a have a fun bet on your favorite team Chelsea to win the Champions League final or you know that that gut feeling that I don't know Brentford will get uh promoted on the weekend and stuff like that they're pretty they're pretty hard to to overcome not saying there's anything wrong with them if you if you know I mean if you're spending hundreds of dollars on good bets and then you're putting five or ten dollars down on a fun bet here and there there's obviously nothing wrong with that but mm. um yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, lots of people that I've talked to on our own podcast. It's just the most, um, I guess, the most the most uh, important traits that a sports better needs to have is is discipline and commitment to your trade. Because yeah, um, that's the, it's the also the uh, also the stomach. And that's really important because one can have pretty big swings like over. Uh, over hundreds and even like a thousand bets, the swings can be enormous, even when you are following a strategy that has been profitable forever. Yeah. And that you can obviously see is going to be be doing it going forward as well, because you can uh, kind of compare whether if you bet on something and then the odds drops, that's a pretty good indication that you took a good bet because the bookmaker is essentially admitting that they priced their odds wrong. So if yeah. you see that happening, then then you should know that you are doing well, but one can still lose money. Um, and then being able to handle that and, and keep sticking to the process, if you agree with the mathematics and everything lines up, then th that's pretty tough for a lot of people. Yeah, that's it. I think, I think 
you're going to come up with a similar trend, especially with trading, options trading, sports betting. You're going to come up with a very similar trend. That a lot of it is down to discipline and trusting the mathematics. In, in investing, it seems to be that earnings, uh, most of the time, price or over the long term, price goes up with the earnings of the company, of the index, of the country, of the world. And as long as you know that and you stick to that process, generally most people have been, well, over the over the long term, everyone has won. Uh, there's no doubt about that if you just held on forever. Uh, it's just, it's very hard in the short term. It's very hard to see those swings, like you say, and the swings happen in the stock market just as much as they, well, probably a little bit less than they do in, in sports betting, but uh they do happen and they do happen massively. Uh, discipline, 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 psychology, stomach, all, all important, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of principles to learn, mate, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> um, mate, that's, that's all really the, the questions we had for you. I think this has been a really interesting oh, chat. And I think for our, for our watchers or listeners, however you've been viewing this, I think it's really, uh, been interesting, you know, hearing some of the parallels between stock, the stock market, and investing, and and also sports betting. So, yeah, really enjoyed having you along today, Paul. Um, ah, thank you for having maybe me. Maybe you just very interesting. no, maybe maybe you just want to let people know where they can find you. I mean, your YouTube channel is pretty self-explanatory, Paul Briscoe. But um, yes, yeah, so maybe some other places people can find you and follow your work. Yeah, I'm obviously my main thing is the YouTube channel. I go through, try to go through the basics of stock market investing and also try and debunk a few myths as well and try and show value, try and keep people on the straight and narrow when they're, when they're giving me these massive uh, companies, which have their stock price has gone up massively over the past couple of weeks. And they're saying, Oh, is this a good thing? I try to bring things back to a more rational level um so you can find me there on youtube and Instagram as well briscoe underscore investing i do loads of meme posting on there it's all fun it's all fun <laughs> i try to keep it a bit funny as well <laughs> <laughs> you can't you can't go wrong with a meme mate um but yeah no thanks <laughs> thanks everyone for watching and and thank you mate once again you've given up a, a decent chunk of your time there and we really appreciate it so yeah thanks for watching everyone like comment any questions you've got for paul and maybe one day he'll come back in and answer them if not uh <laughs> i'll do my best to answer them too and maybe maybe marius can come in and help me out um and and subscribe to the channel and uh we'll see you on our next episode of the make money online series with a guest i do not know yet but maybe we'll uh, we'll venture into another interesting aspect <laughs> of making money online cheers guys